thank you to all of you for being here and uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity for this mini talk. So it's going to focus around interactions between the uh, differential geometry and Lorentz geometry thanks to this tool that I call the, that is called the conformal Gauss map. So first, I want to, to uh, define a good representation of spheres. Why? Well, I'm going to study conformal diffeomorphisms. A conformal diffeomorphism is an application which simply multiply the metric pointwise. Two uh, good examples are the stereographic projection between S3 and R3 at infinity, and the poincare ball model, which is an embedding of H3 inside R3, which is conformal. I'm going to focus on conformal transformation, which are simply conformal diffeomorphism starting and ending at the same space, and in fact, on conformal transformations of R3. And in that case, the Liouville theorem describes them pretty well. They are spanned by translations, dilations, rotation, and the inversion to send x to x over x squared. Okay, and since we have a diffeomorphism between S3 and R3, well, Liouville theorem also describes the conformal transformation of S3. So why is that relevant to what I want to do? Well, that's because there is a characterization of conformal transformation as the transformation that concerns the set of spheres, or in the case of R3, spheres and plane. A plane being a sphere of radius infinity and whose center is at infinity. So we want to describe this uh, set, the set of spheres and plane, in a manner that is uh, that keeps the structure by conformal diffeomorphism. Okay, so as you, as you notice, spheres and plane is kind of a mouthful, so I'm going to simplify it to spheres and consider spheres in S3. The first representation is well center and radius, except this, rep this representation uh, does not keep the structure, so it's not going to be satisfying. So we'll have to be smarter than this. So if we consider the sphere S3 and sigma here in blue, oh, sorry, a sphere inside S3, so you have the center, which is here, and the radius, which can be read on the geodesic, and to sigma, we're going to associate the apex of the tangent cone to S3 at sigma. We can compute the coordinates for this p sigma uh, by x sigma plus 1 over h n sigma, where x sigma is any point on the sphere sigma, and n sigma, the normal to sigma inside S3. And h is the mean curvature, which is directly linked with the radius of this sphere. OK, but the problem is that when the sphere becomes equatorial, totally geodesic, the cone becomes a cylinder and p sigma is sent to infinity. So we will need a projective representation. So if we renormalize P sigma 1, we can put it in S4. But since the apex of the cone is always outside of the unit ball, we're not going to cover all the directions. So it's not going to be subjective, it's not going to be satisfying. But this, in fact, means that P sigma 1 is going to be space-like, so we're going to cover all the space-like directions. So we're going to renormalize by the square root of the Lorentz product of P sigma 1. So this gives us a representation of the sphere sigma in S41. And this representation is good because the conformal group which acts on sigma will act on Y sigma through linear isometrics, through S41. Okay, so here is uh, the representation of a sphere inside S3. And we can say that this sphere is sent to a sphere inside R3 thanks to the stereographic projection. And then the representation becomes this for R3. Same if you have a sphere inside H3, which becomes a sphere inside R3 or S3. Okay, so a sphere is sent into a point on the De Sitter space, which is the image of the set of spheres in plane of R3. Okay, so let's try to apply this in the study of differential geometry. So in differential geometry, we introduce, we study objects like a surface which is immersed in R3. And at any point, we can introduce the classical object, like the tangent plane, and the Gauss map, which is a normal to the surface. The variations of this normal induce the second fundamental four, and the mean curvature, so those are classical objects. A bit less classical is the trace-free second fundamental form, simply A minus its trace part. This object is a bit less classical, but it's going to be pivotal in what is going to follow. So how we are use my representation of sphere? Well, to each point, I'm going to associate a sphere. I want this sphere to keep some information on the shape of the surface, so I'm going to take the tangent sphere at this point, and the radius will be 1 over the mean curvature to contain some curvature information. So I have an application which, to a point of the surface, associates a surface, uh, sphere sorry, in R3. 
So I can represent this phase in R3 and I obtain what I call the conformal Gauss map, what is called the conformal Gauss map. So for an emulsion in R3, I have the following formula for the conformal Gauss map inside S41. This emulsion in R3 corresponds to an emulsion in S3 with this formula, and sometimes an emulsion in H3 with this formula for the conformal Gauss map. So this describes the same point in S41. So this emulsion is going to be a space-like emulsion, and in fact, we compute its uh, the scalar product of nabla y itself. We recover the square norm of the trace-free second fundamental form. So this conformal Gauss map will contain, will code in, the, in some way, curvature information for the surface. So first application, well, since the uh, conformal group will act on y through linear isometries, we know that this is a conformal invariant. So this is going to be a conformal invariant. So this was something that is already known, but thanks to this, we have an elementary proof. Another interesting fact is that we can read the mean curvature in the model space directly on the conformal Gauss map. If we take y5 minus y4, we obtain the mean curvature in R3. If we take y5, we obtain the mean curvature in S3. Okay. And this, this conformal Gauss map is going to be pivotal in uh, my main subject of study, which is Wilmore immersion. So a Wilmore immersion, so in the dimension of in R3, which is a critical point of the integral of A0 squared. So this means that its conformal Gauss map is going to be a critical point of its energy. So this means that the conformal Gauss map is going to be a minimal immersion inside the Jupiter space. And we here have a clear parallel between the situation with CMC surfaces, where a surface is CMC if its Gauss map is harmonic in S2, and the case Wilmore, where phi is Wilmore if its conformal Gauss map is minimal in S41. So we're going to recover the same dialectic and the same information that we're going to be able to read on the conformal Gauss map and the Gauss map. Okay, so I hope to have uh, quickly convinced you that the conformal Gauss map is going to be a useful tool a useful object in Lorentz space to study differential geometry. Uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to display two applications. First, the case of the conformally CMC immersion. So if I take an immersion in R3, or equivalently an immersion in S3, and I wonder, well, are there CMC? Well, this CMC means that the mean curvature is a constant. Since you could read the mean curvature directly on the conformal Gauss map, you can translate this as, well, a linear equation on the conformal Gauss map. So it means that y belongs to one of these two arc plane. Okay, now if I wonder that whether or not phi or x are conformal CMC, that means does there exist a conformal transformation such that phi becomes CMC or x becomes CMC in their respective space? So the problem in R3, in S3, is uh, a bit difficult. You'll have to compute the, uh, the mean curvature. But in S41, with the conformal Gauss map, it, be it becomes, does there exist a linear transformation such that my satisfies the equation of one of these two hyperplanes? So, in other words, does y belong to the uh, image of this hyperplane by an isometry? So, we can translate it in a simple uh, Lorentzian geometric way. Phi x is conf or conformally CMC in their respective spaces, if and only if y lies in hyperplane, and since it's an isometry, the type of the hyperplane is already determined by the ambient space in which you're CMC. And you can even go further and uh, do some uh, the ge differential geometry on Y inside S41 and introduce a numerical characterization of conformally CMC in R3, conformally CMC in S3. So I'm not going to detail the terms uh, inside these numerical characterizations, but know that they are all involved uh, in the uh, Wilmore analysis of uh, a surface, and uh, it, sh it shows how uh, deep the links are between the notion of Wilmore surface and the conformal curves map. An application of this in the Wilmore frame is that, well, Wilmore hemisphere are conformally minimal. This is a, re a result by uh, Robert Bryant. And a consequence, which I, I think you can understand the, its importance in the Wilmore classification of hemisphere, is that the energy of immersed Wilmore sphere is a multiple of 4, uh, four pi, so that the, uh, the energy is quantized at level 4 pi k. Okay, so in that case, a problem which was a priori difficult in the uh, differential framework in R3 becomes elementary once you put it inside S41, inside R41.
in the Lorentz geometry uh, framework. Okay, so that was the first problem. The second problem comes, uh, well, from a uh, question that arises in Wilmore's study of surfaces. If you uh, study Wilmore surfaces intrinsically, you necessarily encounter at some point Tristan Rivière epsilon regularity. If a Wilmore surface has this condition of low energy for nabla n, so for the trace for the second fundamental form, then it satisfies this inequality, the classical epsilon regularity result. I've been able to show the same result with H nabla phi, so only the trace part of the uh, second fundamental form, but we only control H nabla phi uh, in the inequality. So naturally, we can write this thing for the whole second fundamental form for the trace part. Do we have the same thing for the trace free part? So that is something that is natural to uh, to wonder. So it's a problem I have studied with uh, Jan Bernard and Paul Laurent. We started by looking at the gauss codanz equation that links the uh, variations of H with the variations of A0. And if they do that, we could control H minus its half, H bar, by A0. So if H bar is equal to zero, a not small means H nabla phi is also small, which means that nabla n is small, which means that we have this result there. And from this result and this inequality, we can deduce the inequality that we want. So if H bar is equal to zero, we have the result that we want. But the thing is, remember I told you that A not, the, the norm of A not was a conformal invariant. So this inequality there is a conformal invariant. Since it is a conformal invariant, it's enough to show that, well, conformally, h bar is equal to zero. Because if conformally h bar is equal to zero, we do a conformal transformation, we reach this inequality and say it's a conformal invariant, it was true before the conformal transformation, so we have our result. Okay. Of course, wondering whether or not there exists a conformal transformation such so that the average of the mean curvature on a small disk is zero, is a complex problem to formulate inside R3. But inside S41, it becomes a linear problem. Does there exist a linear isometry such that we have this condition? So it's a problem which is much easier to analyze, and we've been able to prove that if this quantity was small enough, we had this result. So since this quantity is equal to the integral of A0 squared, so the L2 norm of A0, we have uh, our desired A0 epsilon regularity result. So once more, a complex problem in differential geometry becomes, well, uh, a, a simpler problem in Lorentzian geometry. But in that case, it loops back to Lorentz geometry. If we consider a space-like minimal immersion in S41, it is the conformal Gauss map of a Wilmore immersion. This Wilmore immersion will satisfy the end of the epsilon energy results if we have a smallness condition on this energy. So we have this result in that case. But since A0 is equal to nabla y nabla y, this yields the following epsilon regularity result for a space-like minimal immersion in S41. I think this result, uh, this kind of result is new in uh, the Lorentz context with Lorentz norm. There are similar results like uh, those of Marmar Zoo, uh, but with uh, Euclidean norms applied instead of Lorentzian. So in that case, we gave insights on the uh, Lorentzian uh, geometry, the analysis of the Lorentzian problem, thanks to the analysis of the uh, differential geometry problem. Okay, and I thank you for your attention.